So thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, and I really want to thank the organizers for this great opportunity. So uh, myself also take it, take it as a chance to organize my thinking, my thoughts of the current uh, solid state AMR and the DMP applications to carbohydrates and sour materials. Uh, so, uh, so we will have two sections. So the first section, uh, I will give a very brief introduction of the re three recent applications in my group uh, with only three slides, uh, followed by a focused discussion of the structural complexity of carbohydrates and the resulted difficulty in resonance assignment. Uh, and we will have a natural break there you know, so for questions and uh, for addressing questions. And the second question, uh, the second section, I will discuss some new opportunities enabled by ultra high field magnet, statistical tools, uh, better pulse sequence, uh, magic kind of spinning, dynamic nuclear polarization, or MSDNT, and the proton detection and the other uh, under explored nuclei. So we only have like a, a less than 30 slides, so we can finish it quite shortly. Mm, the first application of uh, solid state AMR to the field of carbohydrate research is to understand the polysaccharide structure and the polysaccharide ligand interactions in plant biomass for bioenergy applications. So uh, when, when I started my PhD research in Dr. Mei Hong's group, uh, I was mainly focused on the primary plant cell wall, you know, so which is the fast, which is found in the fast growing part of the plant with a remarkable capability of extension. So it can support the plant growth. And for the primary cell wall, we mainly have cellulose microfibrils, uh, which is formed by beta-1,4 glucan chains tightly bonded to form a rigid scanfold. And we have packeting, uh, packeting polymers and also have hemicellulose as a matrix. And when I started my uh, independent career, I, I switched to the secondary cell wall, which is found in the majority of the uh, material plant, for example, in the trees, and also uses the majority of the plant biomass for bioenergy, for biofuel production. Yeah. So, uh, so for example, we can find the woods, we can find the trees everywhere, and they have observed the human society for decades as the construction materials, and also recently as a candidate for biofuel production. And if you take a piece of the stem from the trees and look at it under a microscope, you know, so you'll be able to identify many different types of cells uh, mixed in the uh, stem, in stem, and you can see the morphology of the cell, cell wall directly. And inside of the cell wall, we have cellulose microfibrils, uh, but now in larger bundles compared with the cellulose in the primary cell wall. And we still have hemicellulose, uh, but chemically different from those in the primary cell wall. At the same time, we do not have packeting, but we have a, an additional polymer called the lignin. So lignin is rich in aromatics. And the interactions between the aromatics in lignin with the carbohydrate component gave us a barrier. So these interactions has locked the energy in the secondary cell wall and has made it very difficult to access the carbohydrate components using enzymes or chemicals. So it decreases the efficiency of biofuel production. So recently, in the studies uh, of our group and in the studies uh, from Dr. Paul Dupree's group in Cambridge and Dr. Ray Dupree's group in Warwick, uh, we have revealed the structural principles underlying the polymer uh, interaction interface in the plant biomass. We have identified that the hemicellulose uh, called the xylan can have flat ribbon structure in red color or have non-flat structure in blue color. And the non-flat structure can coat the surface of the lignin aromatic nanodomain as stabilized by a lot of electrostatic interactions. And the non-flat structure can further connect to the flat ribbon structure of the hemicellulose that is coating the surface of cellulose and microfibrils. Structure insight like that provided by solid state MR will give us the structural foundation for optimizing the crops and the plants for better production of bioenergy. 
And another application is to reveal the fungal cell wall structure to guide the design of antifungal drugs. So the, the, the inspiration comes from the uh, recent efforts devoted to the development of antifungal drugs targeting the cell wall polymers in the fungi. In the fungal cell, uh, in the fungi, because those carbohydrates are unique to fungi and they are absent in human cells, so they are perfect target. And the life-threatening infections caused by Aspergillus candida and the Cryptococcus fungus uh, happens to more than two million patients annually, and with a high mortality rate of twenty to ninety-five percent even after treatment. I will take the Aspergillus as an example. So this fungus is an airborne fungus, which means we breathe in and breathe out its spores every day. And for patients with any kind of immune deficiency, they will not have an efficient mechanism to clean away the invading microbes. As a result, the fungus will accumulate in the lungs and form huge fungal balls as revealed by the CT here. You can do surgery, you can remove the fungal balls from the patient, but we know that the fungi are never that easy to fully remove, yeah, and they will reoccur and finally lead to death. So to promote and to guide the drug development, we have resolved this uh, molecular structure of, of the fungal uh, cell wall with assistance from functional genomics and also uh, chemical assay. And we have resolved the three layer structure of the cell wall with the inner layer formed by tightly packed chitin in orange color and the alpha glucan in green color. And the middle layer formed by diverse linked beta glucans, including 1316 linked beta glucans in blue color and the terminal 1314 glucans in purple color. And we also have an outermost dynamical shell formed rich in glycoproteins. And the proteins are represented using the particles. And we also have mannan polymers in gray and the galactan polymers in orange. In an ongoing uh, project that will be submitted soon, we have elucidated how the treatment by antifungal drugs will cause structural defects to the fungal cell wall, and how fungi will uh, reshape the cell wall structure in response to the drug treatment. So it's planning the antifungal resistance. Recently, in collaboration with Dr. Marcotte's group, we have stepped into the field of uh, uh, microalgae research. Yeah, and uh, Alexander has uh, pioneered this study uh, and uh, quantified the glycan uh, composition in the highly rigid and uh, crystalline starch in the highly mobile and abundant uh, glycolipids and in the heterogeneous cell walls. So that is the very first study, uh, you know, so where, uh, and it's followed by a second manuscript that's being uh, prepared to detail the glycoprotein interface in the, uh, in the microalgae cell walls. So we have made some progress, which is good, and we have some new applications, uh, but I want to mention that our technical capability of carbohydrate solid state MR remains so limited at this moment, in particular, uh, if, if compared with the protein uh, MR studies. We have a solid state MR toolbox, and we typically start from uh, isotope enriched materials. For example, if we are studying fungi with carbon-13, nitrogen-15 labels them, uh, and if we start uh, using uh, isotope enriched media, and if we study plants, we will use uh, carbon dioxide, carbon enriched carbon dioxide or carbon glucose, you know, so uh, depending on the growth condition. And with isotope enrichment, uh, you will directly pack the material into a rotor. If it's fungi, it's a living cells. If it's a plant, it's a whole cell, yeah? And then you can measure two-dimensional, three-dimensional correlation spectrum to understand the structural polymorphism, some nanometer length scale packing, set specific hydration, dynamics, and the domain distribution. Combining the information here will be able to provide, to support or exclude the structural models. So you can feel that the flavor of the research is some kind of combination of AMR structural biology and the polymer AMR. Yeah? And we cannot provide uh, high resolution structure like those reported for proteins. 
what we can only provide is the structural and physical and chemical principles underlying uh, the polymer assembly and the interactions in the cell wall materials. And we have some conventional uh, and we have some conventional methods uh, uh, you know, so for characterizing uh, the for, for residence assignment for uh, uh, analyzing uh, uh, molecules with special chemical structures and for understanding the dynamics and the water association of our polymers. Uh, for example, we have the multidimensional carbon carbon nitrogen and even proton correlation experiments that we can use. And we have spectral editing methods that you can select the signals uh, from the bulk, yeah, from the cell wall. Uh, you know, so using their unique structural motifs such as aromatic molecules, nitrogenated molecules, or mobile or rigid components. And you can uh, conduct water editing experiments and or use relaxation dipolar couplings or exchange MR to probe dynamics and hydration. So uh, as a result, we'll have a large site of MR data. These days, uh, after the resonance assignment, the data set for packing, for hydration, and for motion uh, is typically on the range of several hundreds to about 1,000 set of specific data, data points for a large scale study. Uh, uh, but we will not have time to go to details for the later part, and we will mainly focus on simple problem for the first section, resonance assignment. Before you can do anything structurally meaningful, you need to understand your spectrum. So you need to, you to, you need to do resonance assignment. Yeah, so I will take a bracket podium as an example. So this is a model brass, you know, so as shown here, uh, with a relatively simple composition. And that was my first uh, project uh, resonance assignment for a plant system, you know, conducted in Dr. Meihong's lab back in 2012 and 2014. And when we check the literature, uh, I'm quite happy. Yeah, you know, papers report, okay, we mainly have cellulose, which is simple, beta-1,4 glucans, yeah? And we have the hemicellulose, uh, the blue coronal arabinal xylem is a long name, but it can be short written as GAX. And for GAX, we have beta 1 4 linked uh, xylose as a backbone uh, and decorated by arabinose or blue acid residues. And the arabinose residues can be further linked to some aromatics called ferrolate, but the aromatics is not the focus here. Okay, we're happy. We have one, two, three, four, four major types of sugar units, yeah? But we got a complex spectrum like that. So the number doesn't work. Uh, for readiness assignment, the using inadequate or refocus inadequate spectrum, strategy is very straightforward. You just track down the carbon-13 connectivity, uh, for example, from carbon-1 to carbon-5 for the rabinose residue as shown here. And if the resolution permits, you can resolve the connectivity for all sugar units in the cell wall. And you can differentiate mobile and rigid fractions using two different types of uh, experiments. Yeah. Uh, however, we resolved in total 38 sets of carbohydrate signals. You know, so from this uh, bracket, uh, bracket, uh, bracket podium uh, graph, and uh, it take up to a full year of prosthetic life for graduate student, you know, so for myself, yeah, uh, for the readiness assignment itself. So then it makes me to think, okay, what's the cause? What's the reason? What's the structural reasons behind the uh, spectral complexity observed, observed here? We have summarized the five, summarized the five major reasons. And the first reason is the compositional di uh, difference or compositional diversity. So this happens not only when you compare different plant species or when you compare different cell types, but also happens for the chemical composition regarding a single type of biomolecule. For example, hemicellulose here. So the major hemicellulose in the secondary cell wall of the plants is a xylem, but it can have different structure. You can have glucuronic acid or GLCA residue as a side chain in the poplar, and you can have ravenous residue and also as a side chain in spruce, and you will observe different uh, chemical shifts. And we can have a linkage diversity. 
even for the simple arabinose residue, which has a five carbon units, it can have all different types of covalent, covalent linkage patterns. For example, carbon one can be linked to another residue so that this residue become a terminal residue. Terminal residue. And you can have carbon five linked to another residue and you can have linkage happening at carbon three or simultaneously at carbon three and carbon five or at carbon two and carbon five. So the linkage diversity can be tracked by the chemical shift because when a new covalent linkage is added to a carbon site, it will increase the chemical shift a lot. For example, for the two linked arabinose residue, we can have the carbon two chemical shift increase from 82 ppm all the way to 88 and 90 ppm. And when you have carbon five linked to another sugar residue, you will have the chemical shift of carbon five increase from 62 to the range of 68 to 70 ppm. The third, third reason is chemical substitution. Uh, this mainly happens in two ways in carbohydrates. You can have acetylation, you no know, COCH3, or you can have methyl esterification, which is another type of chemical modification. So here we only show the signal, of, uh, uh, we only show the structural acetylation, and you will be able to track the CH3 signal and the CO signals in the spectrum and correlate them with the carbons in the sugar ring. And we can have conformational distribution. For example, in the hemicellular xylan, you can have two-fold or three-fold helical screw symmetry, you know, so conformation uh, for the backbone. And the two-fold here means you have every two sugar un units for three degree helical rotation. And for three-fold, you have three sugar units for three degree helical rotation. You will have flat ribbon structure for the former and a non-flat structure for the latter. And in spectrum, you can resolve their signals very well. And sometimes you have some intermediate conformations bridging the two. Yeah. And you can have uh, you can have additional signals bridging the two islands here, forming a continuous band in the spectrum. And even for cellulose, which is a chemically simple with beta 1,4 uh, linked glucan chains, you can have difference in the hydroxyl methyl conformation. Uh, you have gauge trans or GT conformation for the surface chains, and you have trans gauge or TG conformation for the internal chains, resulting in two well resolvable uh, you know, so clusters of peaks in the 2D spectrum. And the higher level complexity happens to the packing and assembly. In plants, especially for mature plants, you can have multiple uh, elementary microfibrils clustered, bundled together to form large bundles, large fibrils. And that will result, that will create some deeply embedded chains in the middle that is inaccessible to any surface chains. And you will have some surface chains that is hydrophobic, some hi surface chains uh, remaining hydrophilic with their hydroxyl groups uh, accessible to water molecules. And you can have an intermediate layer sandwiched in between. And with the current resolution and with the multiple studies focused on cellulose microfibrils in plants, we can uh, assign the contributions from each type of glu glucose or glucan uh, structures. And beyond this, we have many additional structural factors such as interactions and dynamic distribution or even domain distribution contributing to peak multiplicity, placing a major barrier to resonance assignment. And that's also the reason why we typically rely on type assignment. For example, we report 38 types of sugar units for uh, brachypodium grass. Yeah. And the question I ask myself, is a sequential assignment a possibility? Sequential assignment is the foundation for protein MR structure determination. It's the first step. And for example, we have the NCACX here, and we have the NCOCX here. Yeah. And that allows us to track down, uh, to engineer the polarization transfer pathway to track down the uh, residue connectivity. Uh, however, in carbohydrate, the issue is that the monosaccharide unit forming the polysaccharide, they are so similar in structure, and most of the time they're almost identical. Yeah, uh, and it's impossible to use sequential assignment to track the linkage 
also we say that, okay, from this residue to this residue, their chemical shift might change a little bit due to conformational difference or even additional chemical uh, modification. So the chemical similar similarity requires High, uh, place a higher requirement for spectral resolution, which will be discussed, discussed in detail in the second section. However, when I prepared the slides, I realized that we might have some opportunities for sequential assignment if we have a very special case. For example, we have some chemically diverse and short polysaccharides. Here I show some illustration or some beta glucan segment where you can have beta 1, 3 linear linkage branching point. You can have 1, 3, 1, 4 alternating linkage and even beta 1, 6 linkage uh, coexisting as a cluster. And we have the galactosamine galactin uh, sugar where you, can, you have multiple uh, nitrogenated sugar residues. For example, you have the amide group here, and you have amide group here with distinct chemical shifts that you can use as the initial step. So uh, that might uh, present a promising direction and a lot of work might be uh, doable uh, along this way. And the way we'll uh, rely on the experience, you know, so established by solution MR studies on small oligosaccharides and trying to solve structural problems related to short polysaccharides. So uh, fortunately, uh, we have many strategies that we can use to facilitate and help resonance assignment. For example, a conventional way that we rely on is a chemical assay. We, we can use the linkage analysis and the compositional analysis results uh, to uh, guide our resonance assignment so that we can know which uh, residue and which type of linkage account, uh, I mean, exists as a major uh, fraction uh, and which part may be a minor fraction, you can correlate with the intensity in the spectrum and also correlate with your de novo assignment of the linkage patterns. And here I show a beautiful spectrum uh, done by Artur, also our collaborator at uh, Complex Carbohydrate Research Center at University of Georgia. And uh, he is able to interpret the fragmentation pattern, which seems very complicated to me. And also uh, as detected using mass back after chemical treatment, uh, chemical extraction and chemical treatment of the cell wall molecules. And we can use the functional genomics to help us. You know, we can generate mutants to deplete certain carbohydrates. For example, in a recent study, we have compared four different mutants, each depleting a single carbohydrate from the cell wall and compare with a wild type uh, or control strain. Uh, and here I take the galactomannan deficient mutant as an example. Uh, you know, in the galactomannan deficient mutant, you can see that the box region uh, from the 1, 2 and 1, 6 link, the mannose residues are removed in, the, in this mutant. And it can help you confer, confirm the resonance assignment. And you can compare across different species. For example, you can compare dicot and also plants and the grass species. And the people already have a lot of chemical uh, chemical and the plant biology studies uh, reporting the compositional difference in those two species. And then you can rely on the knowledge here to help the resonance assignment step. And we have coded a complex carbohydrate and magnetic re resonance database to facilitate this process. And, uh, uh, and the database you know, so, uh, index you know, so experimental conditions the sugar name and the structure as well as the publication information. Uh, and in 2019, when the database is first online, we have 450 entries and the days we have some 20, you know, so uh, the counted uh, in the end of last year. Uh, and uh, the goal here is to uh, facilitate you know, so the resonance assignment. Uh, and also it supports multiple functions. For example, you can search by chemical shifts. You can put the numbers, 89 ppm. Yeah, you can get all the corresponding uh, sugar units and the uh, chemical shifts. You can search by carbohydrate name or type, and it also supports user adaptation. The current function is still very primitive. 
and we use this database as a platform to support a longer term measure development. And our vision is that we need to collect and accumulate large data set before we can talk about machine learning practice and automatic assignment. But you can still use the current data set, you know, so to do something useful, for example, you can pull out the density map of different sugar units like cellulose or revenue residues, and you can construct a comprehensive density map uh, for many mixed uh, carbohydrate units and resolve the regions that is character characteristic for certain carbohydrate molecules. So we do not have time to talk about structural determination, but I only want to use one, a single slide to give you a flavor. Uh, this day is because of the very large data set that you can uh, resolve uh, using the plant cell wall and the fungal cell wall studies. From the plant cell wall and the fungal cell wall studies, uh, you need some kind of statistical weighting uh, to of uh, the polymer contact and cell wall assembly. For example, the polymer contact map here uh, reports uh, uh, hundreds of intermolecular cross peaks identified in two hardwood species, including eucalyptus and poplar, and a softwood species called spruce. And we categorize the intermolecular interactions as strong, medium, and weak according to their intensities. And you can summarize the pattern of the interactions happening among the different uh, chemical motifs in the xylan, you know, so in blue color, in the internal and the surface chains of cellulose you know, in orange color, in different motifs or units of lignin yeah, in green, and also in other sugar units. You can easily get some uh, first level information. For example, you know that the poplar and eucalyptus have some kind of comparable pattern. Both of them belong to the hardwood and it indicates structural similarity um, between the hard, among the hardwood species. While softwood spruce is quite unique. And you can observe a lot of very strong interactions uh, happening among different components in softwood spruce as indicated using blue lines. Uh, and it indicated that all the molecules are well mixed on the nanoscale in spruce. So even before you go to details, analyzing the side-to-side -side interactions of different molecules, you already get very useful information projecting toward the nanoscale arrangement of bound molecules. So I will take a short break here, and uh, it's, it's the, the stop for the first section. So before we move to the next section, uh, I think it's time to handle questions. Uh, yes, great. That was very interesting so far. Uh, so there is already one question in the Q&A session. Um, Marcus Cardoso is asking, in the assignment studies, how the C13 enrichment was done? I mean, was it provided to the plant during growth? So uh, carbon-13 uh, enrichment for the plants, uh, you know, is uh, achieved by uh, either providing carbon-13 label the carbon dioxide, you know, so to the plant during growth, if you are using uh, light, light dark cycles, yeah, or light uh, uh, provided uh, growth environment. And if you are having dark growth only, then you can feed the plant with uh, carbon-13 glucose, yeah, so either way, yeah, so depending on the uh, growth condition. Yeah, for the microbes, it's much easier. You can just feed them with the carbon-13 glucose in the media and also nitrogen salt, while the nitrogen salt typically need to be optimized because different uh, strains have different requirements yeah, for the salt, yeah. Uh, so a related question that I had uh, was, so is it possible then to do it selectively somehow to uh, like the similar strategies that they are using for proteins that they can selectively enrich domains and uh, some sort of this strategy, the enrichment? <laughs> Yes, that's actually done a lot. Uh, uh, not not only for carbohydrates, but for different components in the cell wall or in the cell. For example, Dr. Ruth Stark's group uh, has been using uh, uh, DOPA, which is a precursor for melanin biosynthesis, you know, so to label melanin, you know, so and make a contrast to the cell wall carbohydrate background. Yeah, so, uh, and we are also trying you know, so sparsely labeled samples, like one six link, uh, labeled uh, uh, precursors, you know, so for uh, you know, so labeling the cell wall of fungi, you know, so uh, 
uh, I think there are good progress in that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have another question from Alan Lenz. Uh, the assignment data from liquid state NMR can be directly transferred for solid state NMR assignment of polycarbohydrate. Is that correct? So yeah. Yeah. So that's that's a good question. It depends. If the molecule in the cell wall or in the cell is partially cell weighted or is highly dynamic, typically dynamic, then typically the solution MR data is very helpful and is transferable largely to the solid state study. And but but if the carbohydrate remains as a separated hydrophobic domain, uh, we found that the correlates between solution and the solid state MR data is um, less pronounced. Yeah, for example, cellulose. Yeah, when people study cellulose, they need to formulate the materials and dissolve them in ionic liquid or you know so harsh chemicals, and then the chemical shift will be totally different from the chemical shift observed in solid. Yeah, so it depends. Yeah. Okay, if we don't have another question at this moment, we can keep going and take more questions at the end. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So uh, in the second section, we'll talk about uh, ultra high field magnet, uh, statistical analysis, uh, some positive sequence, uh, metric angle spinning DMP and uh, non-carbon and non-nitrogen nuclei yeah, for carbohydrate research. So uh, this is a golden spectrum that I always show you know, so in my presentations uh, regarding the fungal cell wall. Uh, and uh, you know, so it was collected back in 2018 uh, in my lab, uh, in National Mag Lab, you know, so using the living cells of Aspergillus fumigatus. Uh, and we have 30 milligram of living fungi and uh, with the 53 millisecond cord uh, collected on 800 megahertz, we got this decent spectrum with the carbon 13 long with 0 0.4 to 0 0.7 ppm. And that's the starting spectrum for the follow up uh, fungal studies in my, in my group. Uh, uh, and then, so when we have the uh, opportunity to measure the uh, sample on the 1500 megahertz MR uh, magnet, CH magnet at my lab, uh, we got a significant improvement in the spectral resolution. You can see a lot of tiny dots you know, so in the spectrum and instead of the round circles. And uh, with only 10 milligrams of the material, you can finish you know, the experiments, uh, CC or NC correlation experiments within two hours each, and the carbon 13 resolution by analysis is 0.3 to 0.5 millisecond uh, ppm. And this picture shows the giant magnet uh, and then the 35 Tesla uh, uh, magnetic field strength, which correspond to 1500 uh, megahertz proton lamma frequency. And here's a picture of the, uh, the sample. And these days, we are also analyzing uh, the plant cell wall samples and another set of fungal samples uh, in the last run of the SCH magnet. Uh, the plant cell wall sample uh, turned out to be less promising uh, compared with the fungi materials, uh, but the fungal uh, spectral quality keeps improving. So we hope to publish, get our first publication regarding the high field, ultra high field data and so very soon. So uh, carbohydrate uh, analysis you know, so a major type of, uh, of difficulty uh, underlying carbohydrate an analysis is, a, is a, the confirmational distribution. Uh, and this is very different from the uh, chemical diversity of the amino acid residues in the uh, protein MR. And in spectroscopy, typically we have many uh, small regions, small boxes with highly clustered peaks yeah, and with the great resolution on the 1.5 gigahertz MR, we're able to resolve tens of signals within each small box. Yeah, not only for the carbon-carbon, but also for car for car nitrogen-carbon correlation, and not only for the intrinsically uh, crystalline uh, chitin uh, microfibrils, but also for the uh, disordered uh, glucan molecules. So the resolution provided by the ultra high field magnet is partially for uniformly labeled materials uh, might provide uh, the opportunity for analyzing carbohydrate spectral polymorphism with greater details. So when you have spectrum like that, you know that the analysis of the chemical shift becomes formidable. You will have tons of size of signals for each single type of molecule. 
And to facilitate the analysis, recently we uh, tried the, the use of statistical tools, uh, such as the principal component analysis, the PCA, and uh, linear determinant analysis, LDA, to quickly compare and analyze the carbohydrate structure. And the example we use is chitin. So chitin in crystallography uh, studies and the model uh, compound studies, people know that they have multiple major polymorph, uh, allomorphs. We, we have alpha chitin, which is formed by, uh, by anti-parallel uh, packing of the chains. And we have beta chitin, which has a parallel packing. And we have a third type called gamma chitin. And the gamma chitin sometimes and the people just refer it to as an analog, as an alpha chitin, because it has both, uh, you know, so uh, anti-parallel and the parallel wave packing, but anti-parallel wave oh, anti-parallel packing is more pronounced. And the structure that is stabilized by many hydrogen bonding, hydrogen bonds in the system, in the microfibril, you will have OHO hydrogen bonds for the intramolecular association, and you will have NHO hydrogen bonds for the intermolecular uh, association, and the nitrogen is in uh, blue, while uh, oxygen is, is in red color. And uh, that's for alpha chitin, but in beta chitin, you will lose the uh, NHO intermolecular, intermolecular hydrogen bonds. So uh, it will accommodate the different arrangement of the chains and the uh, structure. And using uh, principal component analysis, we have analyzed and compared the result chemical shifts of 45 chitin forms for a single type of molecule, yeah, chitin. Uh, observed in six different fungal pathogens, including three aspergillus uh, species, a black mold called Rhizopus, which is causing the crisis during the COVID uh, pandemic, and two candida uh, species. Uh, and we also compared them with the three crystalline forms the alpha, beta, and the uh, gamma chitin forms. So we have found that the chitin uh, structure is intrinsically heterogeneous as they have uh, very, very broad distribution in both the principal and the, uh, in both the first and second principal uh, component uh, axis. And, but most of the chitin uh, uh, forms identified in fungi has a higher similarity to the alpha uh, model allomorph instead of the beta allomorph. So indicating that they might uh, have a structure that's more similar to the anti-parallel way of packing. So this is, this is the first example. And currently we are using uh, the principal component analysis to analyze the glucans. And also we use a linear uh, determinant analysis to quickly identify which carbon site is the cause of the structure difference and, and uh, signal, AMR signal difference. So uh, for carbohydrates, you know, so you, when resolution is limited, we have to tend to three-dimensional correlation experiments. Uh, and uh, due to the limited choice of nuclei you know, for carbohydrate research, we mainly rely on three-dimensional carbon-carbon-carbon correlation experiments. And the 3D CCC correlation was pioneered by Dr. Baldur's group and Dr. Hong's group. Uh, and recently, we uh, put the refocus inadequate uh, experiment uh, uh, developed by Dr. Uh, uh, Amsley and Lesage and co-workers, uh, and the core sequence developed by Dr. Ho and uh, Polinova uh, together as a three-dimensional double quantum, single quantum, single quantum correlation experiment, CCC correlation. And this experiment uh, is asymmetric regarding to the uh, diagonal body of the 3D, uh, and it gave us a very high resolution. Uh, not only for the aspergillus fungus sample demonstrated here, but also for the plants reported in this paper. So you can see that we have the 2D F2, F3 planes with the well resolved signals for beta 1, 3 glucan, alpha 1, 3 glucan, chitin, beta 1, 3, 1, 4 glucan without any overlap. And the, the way we realized that the experiments had changed from the uh, single quantum, single quantum, single quantum CCC. Uh, and now you extract the F2, F3 uh, plane at a certain double quantum uh, chemical shift. And then you will get uh, two lines of cross peaks. And the sum of the single quantum chemical shift, for example, 74 and 108 ppm here will add up to the double quantum chemical shift in the F1 dimension. 
And the introduction of the double quantum time shift also allows us to resolve some signals that was not resolvable using only single quantum uh, time shift correlation experiments. And this experiment also please, uh, provides a clean detection of long range intermolecular uh, correlations when you extend the cord to a long mixing time such as 300 milliseconds. Magic angle uh, spinning dynamic nuclear polarization uh, enhance IMR sensitivity by 10 to 100 fold. And this is achieved by transferring the polarization from electrons in the stable radicals to the proton and then carbon 13 in the bio molecules. And the uh, previous studies in our group were mainly using uh, AMIPO. And uh, recently, actually, I think uh, earlier this year, you know, so the ACPO pork finally uh, gets commercialized. Yeah. And this, uh, we have very good experience with this radical. Uh, and we typically get the CT fold sensitivity enhancement instead of 20 or 30. And then this radical has a very fast relaxation. And then, you know, so the recycle delay also got shortened because the DMT build up time also got shortened at the same time. And the DMT is achieved by special instrumentation. I'm not as expert in this, but just to give a very short quick, quick head up. So we have the uh, DMT set up at the mag lab for the 600 megahertz, 395 gigahertz instrument with the gyrotron transmitting the microwave through the uh, wave guide to the probe and to a sample. And the cooling is achieved by the cooling chemic cabinet. And this picture shows the wood uh, sample eucalyptus, you know, so packed inside the uh, rotor and also also, a 24 photo sensitivity and enhancement achieved using AMIOPO using the cell wall material. There are many uh, practical factors to consider when you handle and uh, uh, conduct a magic angle spinning uh, dynamic nuclear polarization uh, experiment. Uh, so, uh, for the question, uh, for the question is, would you be able to achieve a homogeneous polarization? Yeah, that can be uh, quickly checked by uh, overlapping the microwave on and the microwave off spectrum. If the spectral pattern are uh, comparable, then it means, okay, I homogeneously polarize everything in my material. And the second question is, uh, would the lines be broadened by uh, cold temperature or paramagnetic effect, you know, so the quenching? Uh, so this can be achieved in multiple ways. First of all, you can uh, compare room temperature experiments with the DMT experiment, uh, spectral. Uh, for sure, you will get a much shorter time for DMT and a much better sensitivity, uh, but typically you will have broader, broader lines. So the broadening effect also happens differently on different, different molecules. If you have cellulose, for example, 89 ppm, yeah, which is microfibril, yeah, so typically it doesn't get broadened a lot at a low temperature because it mainly rely, rely on the order and the criticality for, uh, for the sharp lines. So that's also evidenced by the picture show, shown here when you have 293 Kelvin and when you compare with the 100 Kelvin, the line is only broaden a little bit moderately. And, but for the matrix polysaccharides, such as those uh, in the range of 100 ppm for the carbon one, you know, so also here, so they broaden, uh, they brought their signals get broadened a lot because they rely on dynamics for narrow lines. And when you trap them at a low temperature, then uh, you know, so they suffer a lot uh, from the line, line broadening effect. And for the radical, uh, when we compare the radical free and the radical doped sample, typically we do not have significant broadening effect. And that's because the radicals are preferentially partition to the solvent, which can be tracked using EPR. Yeah, before running the sample. And uh, the radical will stay in the uh, solvent and then uh, rely on relay the proton proton polarization transfer to finally reach the bow molecules yeah, in the cell wall. And uh, in some recent studies by Dr. Linda Emsley's group, I think I have seen some numbers like uh, uh, 40 nanometer to 200 nanometer scale for uh, hyperpolarization in the woody materials. So uh, we typically have two types of uh, MS DMT applications. The first type is to use the sensitivity enhancement and uh, combine it with uh, spectral editing uh, methods such as aromatic selection to probe the lowly populated polymer binding interface and select it against the bulk equilibrium in the cell wall. 
For example, here, uh, this example uh, reported in uh, in our 2019 and 2020 paper, where we, uh, we uh, select a lignin bonded portion of the carbohydrates and found that the non flat structure of three fold dialin is responsible for interacting with the lignin. And the second application is to use the sensitivity to characterize unlabeled materials. And these days, with tens of hours, we can measure high resolution 2D carbon carbon correlation spectrum on unlabeled samples with comparable quality to the labeled materials. And you can track all the different types of glucose units in cellulose, as well as the threefold and twofold dialect. And this opens the possibility of rapid large scale screening of cellular, cellular materials. So the next question to ask is could we measure long range correlation, you know, so using unlabeled samples and using uh, MSDMT measures. And this part has been explored a lot by Dr. Uh, Gil de Pops group, and they have observed the long range correlations up to seven angstrom, if I didn't remember it wrong. You know, so in unlabeled materials, and my group also has some very promising data you know, so showing long range correlation uh, observed using unlabeled materials. And the last thinking is uh, we are unhappy with a very limited choice of carbon-13 and occasional nitrogen-15 for carbohydrate research. Uh, if you think from the structure, you besides the carbon-13 and the nitrogen-15, you for sure had the proton and you for sure had the oxygen. And the oxygen has turned out to be the a very promising nucleus for ultra high field as demonstrated on the 1.5 gigahertz, and that might be some promising direction to go for carbohydrate research. And then for proton, uh, we have it can be replaced to fluorine 19, you know, so which is a hot topic in uh, biomolecular NMR, uh, or it can be replaced to deuterium, where, which can still maintain some kind of reasonable structure for the cell wall or for the carbohydrates. Uh, and even for proton detection these days, we can use 0.7 millimeter rotor uh, and 111 kilohertz spinning for proton detection. And in 2019, almost uh, at the same time, uh, so uh, we have two. Uh, there are there were two papers, you know, so uh, reported for the proton detection of uh, carbohydrate components in the cell walls, uh, with one for uh, peptidoglycan. Uh, peptidoglycan in bacterial cell walls uh, detected under 100 kilohertz spinning. You can see the great proton resolution. And the other one uh, from Dr. Mehun's group uh, reporting the 50 kilohertz uh, you know, so in the spectrum observed uh, on the mobile carbohydrate, carbohydrates of Arabidopsis. You know, so the mobility of the carbohydrates and the combination of moderately fast uh, MS uh, provide a great resolution for resolving the cell molecules. And I think that's also another uh, promising direction that uh, we absolutely need to try. So the take home message, uh, the MR technology allows us uh, to use uh, cellular and living cells to characterize the carbohydrate structure and assembly. And the high resolution uh, uh, enables analysis of carbohydrate structure. And we can use a statistical wheel uh, to analyze the, the large data set related to polymer interactions and also uh, conformational distribution. And there are many new opportunities that enabled by uh, uh, technology development in the field of solid state MR and the DMP. And there are many questions that I ask myself. So which computational approach can help us convert the like 1,000 data points you know, so into meaningful physical model of the cellular complex? And can we enable high throughput and automatic analysis in the short term? And is, is it feasible to fully rely on unlabeled samples that for sure the direction we are currently exploring? And are we prepared for studying carbohydrates in other types of cells, such as the pneumonia cells and uh, human cells ways uh, close uh, relationship between their structure and the functions. And how should we address the complexity for studying cellular mixtures, for example, a pathogen infecting uh, or digesting uh, host cell or plant biomass. So there are for sure a lot of great opportunities and a lot of exploratory, uh, exploratory work that need to be done. So I will stop here. I want to thank my group members, especially uh, Alex, uh, 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 Fabian and Wen Cheng on the plant team, uh, and another uh, honorable 
uh, Melissa and uh, Yisha on the uh, fungal team and uh, changing with the matter development. And I want to thank the very strong uh, instrumental support from National High Magnetic Field Lab and the Environmental Molecular Science Lab. Uh, without their support and without the access to the high field magnets, uh, I'm, I will not be able to do any research. And I want to thank our recent collaborators, you know, so uh, Isabel, Alexander, and Dor on the uh, uh, microalgae research and also Burnett on the uh, uh, on the plant research and finally NSF, UE, NIH and other funding agencies for uh, supporting the uh, projects. So thank you so much for your attention and time. So I think now is the time to uh, have a look at the questions. Thank you very much. We already have uh, some questions. So the first one is from Alan Lenz. How can we incorporate fluorine nuclei into biological polycarbohydrates? Yeah, so that's for sure some some something to consider. You know, so uh, it's not it should not be easy. There are some fluorinated small compounds. Yeah, but that's that's not the final goal we want to do. So uh, either uh, using chemical Synthesis, you know, so for uh, feasible pre precursors, and uh, and then combined with some biosynthetic pathway in the micro microbes, for example, that might be the way to go. Yeah. Okay. So the next question is from Klaus Mintrohr. Uh, we and others have seen cellulose decrystallization and pronounced line broadening when wood is finely powdered. Uh, for example, with a Dremel tube. How do you process your plant matter mechanically to get into a small rotor? Does this treatment affect the observed line widths? Yes, so uh, that's a good question. So we typically just use a razor to cut it into small pieces. Yeah, so like millimeter scale, small pieces. And then so if needed, we'll hand grind it a little bit. Yeah, so, uh, and then the long ways we didn't really observe broadening since the quality you can see, you know, so from our data is quite comparable to the, uh, to the room, you know, to the room temperature, even you know, so high resolution data. And also we have the 2019 cellulose, you know, study uh, uh, published on cellulose, uh, studying the cotton fibers, you know, so which we not only grind them and cut them, but also, um, uh, dope with radical, yeah, and they give sharp lines like 0.7 ppm long width, yeah, under DMP. So, uh, what we found is you cannot mill, you cannot uh, ball mill it. If you ball mill it, it fully destroys the native structure. But if, if you use a razor, just hand, hand cut them, that should be okay. Uh, the next question is from Yanina Pantrakova, Pantratova, sorry. Uh, does cooling down the samples in DMP experiments to very low temperatures significantly affect the interactions between components of cell walls? Is it fair to interpolate conclusions made in such low temperature experiments to the structure of cell walls at normal conditions when the cells are alive and functioning? It's a bit long, so you can read it. Okay, yeah. So it's basically okay. Does cooling down the sample in DMP will significantly affect the interactions? Uh, you know, so so we have the crowd protectant, yeah. So in the sample, you know, so which at least should preserve, you know, so the native structure of the cell to a large extent. Uh, uh, and it's, you know, it's also used for maintaining you know, so cell cultures you know, materials in the you know, very long term. Uh, but I would could not say that the DMP will not uh, perturb the interactions of molecules. You know, so definitely, I, I would say, okay, it should have some uh, interactions. You know, so for example, you know, for cellulose itself, it's a chemical shifts observed at a high temperature, at a low temperature uh, will change a little bit. Yeah, so for example, carbon 6 will change one way, carbon 1 will shift the other way. But the change is on the range of 0.1 to 0.2 ppm, but you can observe. Yeah, so the, the difference. Yeah, so that's due to the change in the hydrogen bonding system. You know, when the hydrogen bonds will change, then I would say the physical packing interaction will also change a little bit. But if molecules are packed in space, then I would say, okay, the general principles would still hold. If two-fold dialing is packed close to cellulose, three-fold dialing is packed close to lignin, that will not be affected by low temperature, you know, so fully swap their loads. That's my thinking, yeah. Uh, the next question is from Akshay Kumar. 
how do you make sure that the DMP enhancement is uniform throughout the sample if we cannot have a highly sensitive microwave of spectrum? For example, on lignin regions in case of natural abundance samples. And also how to decide optimum DMP build-up time in that case. Yeah, so uh, so for the for our samples, even for the ligning, yeah, we gave zoomed in region, uh, you, we gave the zoomed in region so the signals and then we overlay the non-DMP and the DMP spectrum to make sure it's homogeneous and polarized. Uh, and these days, you know, so marrying one dimensional spectrum, even for ligning and the DMP enhancement should not be a problem. <laughs> yeah, if not one scan, then you may need like 256 scans, but you can get it for sure. Yeah, so uh, for the DNP build up time, that's the tricky part. Uh, you might have difference for lignin and uh, carbohydrates, you know, so due to the native chemical difference. Uh, sometimes we observe short DNP build up time for lignin and the long, slightly longer DNP build up time for the carbohydrate. Then depending on the purpose, if we feel like, okay, the lignin is a more challenging aspect and we want to focus on it, then we will use 1.3 times the DMP time, you know, so for the recycle delay for the ligning part and ignore the carbohydrate because they will always be dominating the spectrum anyway. Yeah, so I think, you know, so there are a lot of tricks that you can play yeah, depending on the condition. And also you can, you know, so decrease your radical concentration if your DMP build up turn out to be too fast. Yeah, so or the opposite way you can have opposite operation. Yeah, so you can always fine tune things. Yeah. And uh, a general question I had, uh, so for your uh, double quantum experiments, usually for the inadequate, are you using the dipolar or the J variant? And what's more useful? Uh, we use both. So uh, so for J inadequate, we typically couple with a direct polarization, carbon direct polarization with short recycle delays for the mobile components. You know, so because the short recycle delay will serve as a a carbon T1 relaxation filter somewhere, yeah. So, and then to uh, remove, filter out the signals from the rigid components. And then we also use a uh, uh, CP base, you know, so, uh, and then dipolar base inadequate, yeah. So, for more rigid components, depending on the purpose. Yeah. 